This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Berkeley graduate lectures, the Hitchcock lectures. And as you heard yesterday when um, Carol gave her first talk on how telomeres cause age-related disease, uh, there's a great story in uh, discovery that can be serendipitous. And so today, Carol, um, I'll introduce her shortly, will give us a story that's been retitled The Anatomy of a Scientific Discovery. She's going to tell you really much more about the process of how scientists discover things that are later deemed to have high impact, as we all would agree, from the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So Carol is a professor and director of molecular biology and genetics at Johns Hopkins, but she started as a California native. She uh, was born and raised here for the most part, and she went to UC Santa Barbara for her undergraduate degree, and then came here to UC Berkeley for her PhD. And from there, went to Cold Spring Harbor a Laboratory as faculty, and in 97, then to Johns Hopkins. But it's from Cold Spring Harbor from the early 90s that I know Carol, where uh, I had the pleasure of joining her research group. And uh, there are many things that you'll hear that are really important features in a scientist who's committed to doing uh, discovery basic research. And Carol exemplifies, really, those features. And I think, uh, in part, the MCB graduate program here and Carol, to me, uh, have the important um, starting point, as she'll talk about, of curiosity-driven research and hard work. But I say that it takes much more than just curiosity and hard work, because it also takes the patience to let the question unfold, to let the real question that you should be answering unfold, as opposed to the question you started asking. And also it takes the insight to recognize when the question you should be asking comes along. And I'll just um, quote, in fact, from the 1945 winner of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, Sir Alexander Fleming, whose comment was, one sometimes finds what one is not looking for in describing his discovery of penicillin, which he discovered accidentally. Uh, he's a bacteriologist. He loved to watch and understand how bacteria grew. And he had stacks and stacks of plates from his curiosity and his hard work, and he put them aside. And one day, he happened to notice in the corner of one of these plates a giant colony of mold. Uh, and, you know, this is not what he set out to do, to grow mold. <laughs> but uh, he noticed something about this mold, and it was this insight that led him to penicillin. He noticed that this particular mold wasn't just competing with the bacteria for space on the plate. It was actually killing the bacteria that surrounded it on the plate. And from there, he recognized, he had that insight that, hmm, this could be a new question to study as opposed to the question that I started this experiment with in the first place. And I really, I've learned a lot from Carol, and I've learned a lot from this process of learning not just to be curious, but to have more patience and to let the questions um, change and evolve and take you to what um, you weren't sure you were asking in the first place. So thanks, Carol, and um, welcome back to Berkeley. 
Well, thank you very much for that um, perfect introduction for um, what I'm uh, hoping to uh, tell you today. So um, yesterday we talked um, a little bit about the uh, science of telomeres and telomerase. Uh, and today I thought that I would um, take off a little bit and, and use uh, telomerase and the discovery um, of telomeres uh, as a way of telling a story um, about exactly that, about how um, serendipity and, and chance uh, play uh, a role uh, in the progress of science. So once again, as we were discussing yesterday, we'll be discussing uh, telomeres. Uh, for, so for those of you uh, that uh, weren't here yesterday, I'll just uh, go back over this. Uh, within uh, the uh, nucleus uh, of a cell, you have uh, chromosomes, and the genes are all along the length of the chromosomes, and the telomeres are these end uh, parts that protect the ends and maintain the length. And so we'll be um, talking a little bit about um, some of the uh, discoveries along uh, the path to um, understanding uh, the role of telomeres um, in, uh, in a number of different organisms. So if you think about uh, scientific discovery, uh, in hindsight, it may seem uh, that the uh, discovery is um, a fairly linear process. So um, telomeres were first uh, recognized as important uh, components in the 1940s. And then uh, the telomere sequence is identified. And then it was clear uh, that there was a role um, of telomere elongation in telomere length maintenance. Telomerase was predicted. Telomerase was then discovered. We then understood the connection of telomeres and cancer. Uh, and then uh, telomeres in disease, and then in 2009, uh, a Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of telomerase. So it may seem like this is a linear process, uh, when in fact, uh, the process is really much more complicated than that. Um, so what I'll be doing is um, explaining how, in reality, the process is very messy, involving serendipity, personal interactions, uh, insight, hindsight, uh, and, and various other approaches. So I don't expect you to um, uh, understand um, all of this yet. We'll kind of go through it and, and work our way through. Uh, but there are two points that I want uh, to make uh, at the beginning. Uh, the first of all is that this timeline is not um, an accurate linear timeline. Uh, you'll see that the 1980s are greatly overly represented here. Uh, there was a lot of um, uh, uh, particular progress uh, that went on uh, in the 80s uh, and the uh, early 90s. Uh, so this isn't meant to be um, uh, uh, an accurate linear representation of time. Um, but also, um, I'm taking a fair amount of artistic license here. So uh, this is not meant to be any kind of a definitive history. And I apologize in advance uh, for anyone whose important discovery I might uh, not mention. Uh, this is really meant to be more metaphorical um, about um, how uh, the process of discovery um, unfolds. Uh, so this isn't meant to be uh, taken as a, uh, a definitive history uh, by any means. Um, but there are going to be some themes uh, that I'm going to uh, bring out uh, during this talk. Uh, and the first is that curiosity uh, is a driver of science. Discoveries tend to happen in batches. That's in part because people talk to each other. Uh, but it's important that discoveries happen in batches uh, because replication is really essential to establish a new discovery as something fundamentally new. Fields collide and inform each other. So you may be working in one area and then start working in another area, and it's the juxtaposition of those fields uh, where a lot of new things uh, can uh, usually be found. And scientific discovery is not like engineering. Changing direction or objectives can be a good thing, very much like what you just heard uh, from Kathy, being able to be distracted by something that may be uh, the question that you really should ask. Uh, and then finally, um, another quote, uh, this one from Louis Pasteur, uh, that chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, so we'll be working uh, through some of these themes as we uh, go through, uh, as an example of a scientific discovery, uh, some of the discoveries um, about telomerase. So um, the telomeres were first functionally defined as uh, units that protect chromosome ends uh, in the 19, uh, late 1930s, early 1940s by H.J. Uh, Muller working in Drosophila and Barbara McClintock uh, working in maize, showing that there were uh, functional units that had to protect uh, chromosome ends. Uh, but then that uh, initial recognition of these functional units had to wait a number of years uh, before uh, we could really understand anything about uh, the mechanism of what these functional units actually do. 
So it was in uh, 1972 that there was a uh, paper that was published uh, by uh, Jim Watson, uh, one of the co-discoverers of the structure um, of DNA. Uh, and what he defined is what's called as uh, the end replication problem. The problem with replicating the end of any kind of a linear uh, DNA molecule. And so if you have uh, such a linear DNA molecule, it turns out that what was known uh, in the 1970s was the mechanism by which this replication occurs is that you start copying this chromosome uh, from an internal uh, location. And um, when you then copy to the very uh, end of the linear molecule, it turns out that there's a small region, because of the biochemical mechanism by which these are made, there's a small region at the very end of the chromosome which isn't copied. And as you go through this process and continually copy uh, many chromosomes, you then expect uh, that chromosomes uh, would shorten uh, progressively uh, from their ends. So this was a theoretical paper that was published uh, by Jim Watson. Um, and around uh, the same time, it turns out that there was a paper, also a theoretical paper, um, published by um, Alexei Alovnikov in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. Um, although he did not use the term uh, telomere in this paper, uh, he uh, noticed that there may be a problem with copying the ends of molecules, and he used this term uh, marginotomy, being the margins of the chromosomes, instead of using the word telomere. Um, and because of that uh, different usage of words, uh, his uh, publications weren't well known to the telomere community until a number of years later. However, um, Alavnikov did show that, um, that there was this theoretical problem of copying the ends of chromosomes, and he had the important insight uh, to link that uh, to a paper that had been published in the 1960s uh, by Len Hayflick, uh, which suggested that if you uh, take uh, primary human cells and put them in culture, that they have a limited lifespan in culture. So this limited uh, lifespan of human cells uh, was termed cellular senescence. So uh, back in the 70s, uh, these two um, ideas were linked. But as you'll see, we weren't able to uh, uh, follow up on what that meant uh, until a number of years later. So the first molecular characterization um, of telomeres, and, and this is one of the themes that we'll bring out, is that as soon as you um, identify actual uh, components and the uh, molecular mechanisms, uh, it's easier to uh, understand function. So the first molecular characterization uh, came from the uh, identification of the telomeric uh, DNA sequence in tetrahymena, this single-celled uh, organism that has uh, 40,000 chromosomes. Um, and what's shown here is a, a nice um, electron micrograph of um, this uh, particular molecule, which is important from tetrahymena, uh, which was a 21 kilobase molecule um, that has telomeres um, at both ends. And so um, Elizabeth Blackburn um, and Joe Gall were very curious about um, what was the actual DNA sequence that was at the ends of those chromosomes. Uh, and they published this paper in um, 1978. And what they showed is that there were um, many copies of this very simple uh, sequence on uh, both of the ends um, of these molecules. And so that then defined uh, the telomere repeat sequence uh, for the first time uh, in any organism uh, as these tandem repeats of simple sequences. So this paper was in 1978. Uh, shortly thereafter, just uh, three years uh, thereafter, uh, there was another paper, again, from ciliated protozoa, uh, in this case, uh, Oxytrica, which um, looks uh, a little bit like its uh, cousin Tetrahymena, although they are actually uh, quite distantly related. Uh, and what this group um, showed was that there was a very similar tandemly repeated DNA sequence on the ends of the chromosomes uh, in four other uh, ciliates. Uh, so in this case, uh, this oxytrichid telomere sequence was tandem repeats of the sequence T4, G4. So there's T4, G4, T4, G4. And then they showed at the very end, there's an extension on, on one of these DNA strands relative to the other. And it turns out that this was a, a very important uh, functional uh, characterization uh, of the ends of the chromosomes. So the end replication problem should predict that uh, telomeres shorten every time cells divide, uh, because you can't completely copy to the end of the chromosome. Um, and so in understanding this as a theoretical problem, uh, the, there was sort of a mindset as to, OK, how are you going to overcome uh, this telomere shortening? Um, However, telomere shortening was not seen when you were growing uh, these tetrahymena uh, cells in culture. So why was it that, that telomeres 
aren't apparently shortening as cells are growing uh, in culture. In fact, it was found very shortly thereafter that telomeres would actually get longer in some single-celled organisms as you grew them in culture. And this was very counterintuitive. So um, unexpectedly, there was this telomere elongation. Uh, and this was a paper from um, another single-celled organism, uh, terpanosomes. Um, and uh, if you look on this, uh, this southern blot here, there's a, a band that does not change size as these cells are growing uh, for increasing numbers of divisions in culture. Um, but then this telomeric uh, band here, as you grow these cells, it actually got longer, which is the opposite of what one had been thinking about with this end replication problem. So this didn't make a lot of sense. However, when you do the same experiment um, in tetrahymena, where the telomeres were first identified, again, it was seen that the telomeres actually uh, got longer. So um, here are cells grown for increasing numbers of cell divisions. Uh, and this uh, telomeric band, uh, you can see uh, increasing uh, in length as these cells are grown continuously uh, in culture. So this is another example of uh, discoveries happening in batches. So we really uh, believe that this is the case that the, there is this telomere elongation, but yet we don't know um, why that is. So in the early years of uh, the telomere research, we were really gathering pieces of the puzzle together. It didn't, they really didn't fit, um, but by gathering up all these various different pieces, then trying to interpret uh, what may be occurring. So uh, the telomeres were shown to be uh, functional units, and then the end replication problem was proposed, and that was linked uh, to cellular senescence. Uh, the telomere sequence uh, was also identified, which allowed uh, an understanding of um, what's going on at the molecular level, uh, and then one was able to see this telomere um, addition. So that was sort of the, the, the early stages of trying to understand what was going on uh, with telomeres um, in cells. The next uh, important functional uh, characterization uh, came from this experiment uh, that was done by uh, Liz Blackburn uh, and Jack Shostak, uh, where they uh, were able to show that uh, tetrahymena telomeres would function as telomeres um, in yeast. So uh, here is a, a circular plasmid, which was very familiar to people that were uh, studying uh, yeast. And when you take that circular plasmid uh, and open it up and add tetrahymena telomeres, um, onto the uh, ends of these uh, chromosomes, these actually, the tetrahymena telomeres functioned as telomeres uh, in yeast. Uh, and as I'll be uh, saying in a, in a few minutes, they were actually uh, elongated uh, in the yeast. Uh, but this paper uh, was published here uh, in, uh, in 1982. Um, and uh, in 83 uh, and in 84, again, uh, similar kinds of uh, findings were also made uh, independently uh, by other groups. So here's one uh, paper which has a, a kind of unusual uh, title um, that, that doesn't really tell you what's happening in the paper. But what they did uh, in this paper, also uh, published in Nature, was they showed uh, that there must be GT-rich sequences uh, which are present uh, on the ends of chromosomes um, in, uh, in yeast. And they showed that there was addition of GT-rich sequences onto the tetrahymena telomeres. Also, uh, in 1984, there was a paper that showed uh, that uh, when you take telomeres in yeast, if you take now, in this case, oxytrichotelomeres telomeres and put them into yeast, that those oxytrichotelomeres telomeres would function as telomeres in yeast and that they were elongated. So um, again, here's an example of discoveries happening in batches and reinforcing one another. Uh, so this general concept that telomeres would work in a variety of different organisms um, was uh, clearly um, very well established. And then later uh, in, in 84, uh, the um, uh, Shostak and Blackburn lab uh, went on and um, identified the actual uh, sequence uh, which was added on to these uh, tetrahymena telomeres um, in yeast. Um, and from this paper, they proposed uh, that there may be some kind of an activity, a telomere transferase-like activity, that would extend this uh, GT-rich strand um, of the yeast telomeres. In the exact same journal where, uh, where this was published in, uh, in Nature in 1984, uh, the next paper in the journal was a paper uh, by a group 
that was also proposing a way that you could elongate telomeres. How is it that telomeres um, are shown to be elongated, and why would you have uh, these sequences added on to the tetrahymena telomeres? And I'm not going to take you through um, this uh, complicated model, but basically what this um, group proposed was that there was a, uh, a recombination mechanism um, by which uh, telomeres uh, could be added, um, as opposed to a de novo addition mechanism. So um, I'll just show you the cartoon here. A recombination mechanism, um, you can imagine that if you have um, a particularly long telomere and then a short telomere, is that you can actually um, copy this uh, one strand from the short telomere can invade the longer strand, and you get net elongation of the short telomere uh, and then uh, repair synthesis. But the main point here is that you start off with a long telomere and a short telomere, and you end up with two long telomeres via a mechanism that was a well-known uh, mechanism in the uh, DNA repair field. Uh, in contrast, um, what had been uh, proposed uh, for the uh, de novo addition is uh, simply adding onto this three prime end sequences in this direction and then uh, filling out and getting net elongation by this mechanism. So uh, the same set of data led two different groups to propose uh, two very different models. So um, understanding that telomere addition um, may be uh, occurring, um, one group proposed a recombination-based model, uh, and another group proposed that there would be de novo elongation. So it wasn't necessarily clear um, how this would come out in terms of uh, the uh, importance to telomere replication. Um, and as you will see, um, we'll be talking a lot about de novo elongation, although um, later on, recombination also um, will turn out to be um, important uh, in addition. So, um, so both of these uh, pathways uh, will uh, turn out to be important. So um, when I came to uh, Berkeley to work with um, Elizabeth Blackburn, I was then uh, charged with uh, trying to understand, is there any evidence for something which would add new telomeres onto uh, the ends of chromosomes? So to test uh, one of those two models, which was the de novo elongation model. Um, and so uh, what we did was to um, take, again, uh, tetrahymena, which has a source of many telomeres, and we were hoping would have a source of uh, many of the components which were necessary for making telomeres, um, and to grind them up and put them into um, a test tube with the right sort of reagents. And the reagents would be something which would mimic uh, natural telomere end, and um, the precursors for the uh, telomeric sequence, which is necessary to be made. And what we found was that uh, this enzyme uh, telomerase uh, would extend the primer by adding sequences of the um, telomeric repeats. Um, and that um, is what is shown here, uh, the elongation of the, of the telomeres. So this was just um, one year uh, later, um, after the initial discovery that the telomeres were added um, onto the um, tetrahymena um, telomeres in yeast. Then by asking the question, um, how is it that you can actually um, have an enzyme add something that is not templated onto the ends of chromosomes, um, we propose that uh, perhaps uh, there's a uh, essential nucleic acid uh, involved that is uh, an RNA component uh, and we identified uh, this uh, small uh, RNA, uh, which contains uh, the complement of the uh, telomeric repeats um, as part of the RNA, and showed that the way that the telomeres are elongated is by copying this uh, template uh, within uh, the telomerase. So those uh, discoveries happened in a relatively um, uh, short period of time. So after we understood about the telomere addition and the de novo elongation, um, this predicted uh, the telomerase. Uh, telomerase was discovered, and the RNA component um, was identified um, just a few years uh, thereafter. So we're basically collecting up the different kinds of components um, of uh, the, the machinery that's necessary uh, for maintaining uh, telomeres. So another question that we didn't really know very much about that was going on um, about the same time was trying to understand um, from the standpoint of the telomere, what's actually bound uh, to the telomere itself. Um, the telomerase uh, would be the uh, enzyme which would make this longer, uh, but what is normally here along the telomere? And so a number of groups were interested in identifying um, what the components might be uh, that would uh, make up uh, the telomere um, itself. 
And in a series of papers that were happening um, in the, um, the middle 80s, um, again, uh, the telomeric binding proteins were first characterized by uh, Dan Gottschling uh, and Tom Chuck, again, in ciliated protozoa, these organisms that have uh, many uh, tens of thousands of telomeres. Again, going to the, the source of where telomeres um, are most uh, plentiful. Uh, so they found uh, that there was evidence uh, for a specific uh, telomere complex. Uh, and then Dan Gottschling and Ginger Zakian were able to um, identify uh, the specific uh, proteins that were bound in that complex, uh, and then finally um, actually uh, cloning to know the individual um, subunits of this telomeric complex um, occurred um, in, uh, in the early 90s. So the discovery of telomerase then was um, around the same time as the uh, discovery of these telomere binding proteins uh, identifying the, uh, the individual components. So at, the, at this point, uh, what we knew about was uh, that there were uh, these telomere binding proteins, and most of the work had been done um, in either, either yeasts or um, ciliates, either tetrahymena uh, or oxytreca. And it still wasn't necessarily clear to the uh, wider community um, of biologists that what we knew about telomeres in these single-celled organisms really would be informative um, of anything that might happen um, in, uh, in humans or uh, in, in other mammals. That is, um, what relevance did this actually have to uh, human disease? Uh, now, certainly, uh, from the standpoint of, um, of a, a biologist, um, we knew that something that was very um, fundamental for all cells very likely um, would be conserved uh, throughout uh, many different organisms, although it wasn't necessarily um, uh, clear to the scientific community at that time. So the first hint of what was actually going on uh, in human cells uh, came in the, uh, the middle 80s, uh, from this paper that was published uh, by Howard Cook's lab. Um, and what they found was that there is um, a region um, on the X and the Y chromosomes uh, which was very close to the human telomere. So this is an, uh, just a cartoon of the human um, X and Y chromosomes. And of course, most of these chromosomes, uh, most of the, the DNA on these chromosomes is different from each other. But it turns out that there's a region which is called a pseudoautosomal region, um, which has sequences that are present um, on both the X and the Y chromosomes. And Howard Cook was um, trying to understand uh, this pseudoautosomal region. And what he came across was that um, when he probed for these probes, uh, that the bands that he saw were very heterogeneous. And this looks very much like uh, this heterogeneous um, sized band that was seen for telomeres in both uh, tetrahymena uh, and in yeast cells. So here was a, a hint that um, the evidence that we had for what telomeres would look like um, in uh, these uh, single cell eukaryotes may actually play a role um, in human telomeres. And they went on then to do uh, really the definitive experiment at the time uh, to show something that something really is telomeric, um, what you do is you, uh, you take and you treat with a nuclease, and this is an, an enzyme which will chew away from the end. Um, and this um, heterogeneous band here then, if you chew away with it with a nuclease for increasing amounts of time, uh, it decreases in size. Um, so this suggests that it really is the natural end um, of the chromosome. Uh, so this was in, uh, in 1985, and we didn't yet know the sequence of the actual telomere. Okay, so these bands, they are identifying because they're looking with sequences that are very near the telomere. Um, so they still didn't know what the actual telomeric sequence was um, of the, the human uh, sequence. It wasn't until uh, 1988 uh, when uh, the Moises group was uh, interested in looking at repetitive DNA sequences uh, from humans, uh, and they came across uh, this repetitive sequence, uh, T2AG3, and they were able to show that that repetitive sequence, when you hybridize that to human chromosomes, and you may uh, be able to see here on the ends, uh, these faint yellow dots on these uh, red uh, human chromosomes, they were able to show uh, that this repeated sequence is actually present uh, not only on the human chromosomes, but also on uh, many other vertebrate uh, chromosomes, um, mouse and a variety of uh, other organisms. So this now um, definitively identified uh, the human telomeric sequence, uh, and this was really uh, an enabling discovery because it allowed uh, um, testing of models for what's happening um, with, with human telomeres. Again, um, 
the uh, discovery uh, in one lab leads to um, rapid discoveries uh, in other labs. So the uh, human telomeres and the, the entire sequence of the human telomere was then uh, cloned uh, by two different groups, again, in back-to-back uh, -back, uh, papers um, in nature. And uh, these groups used the exact same um, approach as had been identified for cloning the yeast telomere by Blackburn and Shostak, that is to take and um, put human DNA into yeast cells and show that that human DNA actually functions as a telomere. And they used uh, nuclease sensitivity to show that that uh, hum cloned human uh, DNA actually was telomeric. Uh, and this is once again another uh, example of discoveries happening in batches. Um, and this is important, um, not just because a lot of things are happening around the same time, uh, but because by these very similar findings coming from uh, different groups from different angles, um, it really um, established in a very short period of time uh, the importance um, of these sequences. So we had been uh, focusing on uh, telomerase and the telomerase components, uh, the telomere binding proteins, um, and then uh, with the identification of the human telomere sequence, uh, that then allowed us uh, and others uh, to uh, go on and test models um, that uh, had been uh, around for a number of years. And specifically, the model that, um, that we were able to test uh, was this question about uh, telomere shortening uh, in primary human cells as they divide in culture. As I said, it had been proposed uh, in the 1970s that the um, progressive telomere shortening uh, in human cells may play a role um, in cellular senescence. And so um, I was uh, fortunate to uh, collaborate to be able to um, ask this question. Very shortly after the identification of the human uh, telomere sequence, uh, we were able to show that if you actually take human cells and put them in culture um, as Hayflick um, had done and show that these cells divide for a certain number of times in culture and then stop dividing. And we were able to use the human uh, telomeric uh, DNA probe uh, and show that indeed uh, the telomeres shorten progressively um, as these cells um, are dividing in culture. Not only does this happen with um, cells that are dividing in culture in humans, but um, it also actually happens in human cells with age. Uh, so this is an example of the um, average uh, telomere length uh, taken from a, a gel like I just showed you uh, compared to um, the uh, age of the individual, um, and that there is a progressive uh, telomere shortening uh, with age in these um, human uh, white blood cells. And now, um, having recently uh, discovered uh, telomerase and understanding that telomerase is necessary to add sequences onto the ends of chromosomes, uh, what we initially thought was, well, these cells perhaps don't have telomerase, and so they're shortening progressively in the absence of telomerase. So that's what we thought then, that there was no telomerase in these somatic cells. Um, but now what we uh, think is happening is that um, although there may be telomerase activity in those cells, the telomerase activity is limiting, and the cell division can outpace the elongation that's occurring by telomerase. So uh, within the lifetime of these individuals, there's so much cell division going on in the blood cell compartment uh, that the uh, division gets ahead of the ability of telomerase to elongate those telomeres, and that's why you see uh, this telomere shortening. So as I mentioned, uh, it was proposed um, a while uh, before that cellular senescence uh, may have some, that telomere length may have some role with cellular senescence. And so this is really the point that um, ideas aren't always connected in a linear fashion. That past work that we didn't really understand maybe how it fit in uh, to, the, um, to the story uh, can then become relevant later on. And in this case, um, it became relevant uh, because we knew the human telomere sequence. And we needed to know what that sequence was in order to do the experiment uh, to ask about the telomere shortening. Uh, so indeed, knowing this human telomere sequence uh, then led us to understand um, about the cellular senescence, um, even though this uh, had previously um, been published uh, a number of years before. So along with understanding the telomeres and cellular senescence, the other thing that was um, quite uh, enabling uh, for understanding uh, with the, the human telomere sequence was understanding about telomeres uh, and cancer. Um, and um, the, the same uh, year that we were looking at uh, cellular senescence, uh, Tita DeLonga and um, uh, with Harold Varmus uh, were looking um, in both cancer cells uh, and at um, different tissues. Um, and what's shown here 
is the fact that there is uh, tissue specific differences in telomere length uh, within people. So uh, they're looking at telomeres that are, are quite long in one person, uh, comparing the sperm telomere length to the blood telomere length. So these are two different tissues and two very different uh, telomere lengths. Uh, another example here, uh, sperm versus blood, much longer telomeres uh, in this setting. Uh, and then um, over here, what they found was that if you compare uh, normal tissue to tumor tissue, that there was significantly shorter telomeres in the tumors. Um, again, normal uh, and tumor, so there were shorter telomeres uh, in tumor cells than in normal cells. And we now uh, can understand this uh, because uh, that tumor cell has gone through more rounds of cell division uh, than uh, it otherwise would have uh, due to um, uh, some uh, change, uh, genetic change that allows it to divide, and that more rounds of cell division then um, allows this uh, telomere shortening. So, uh, as I uh, had mentioned before, discoveries uh, happen in, in batches. Um, so, um, that uh, very same year, there was uh, another paper which was also published, showing in this case the, the normal is shown, normal telomeres here, and tumor telomeres from the same uh, sample. Normal and tumor, normal and tumor. So there's uh, telomere shortening uh, in cancer cells. So, discoveries happen in batches, and independent replication is very uh, important for verification of fundamental um, ideas. So in addition to understanding the telomere length uh, in tumor cells, uh, it was interesting to know um, what is the role of telomerase activity uh, in tumor cells. Um, and so uh, we were interested in um, the role of uh, telomerase and when telomerase uh, may uh, be present in tumor cells. And so this particular paper, uh, telomere shortening associated with chromosome instability is arrested in immortal cells which express telomerase activity, um, was the first example of telomerase being activated in cancer cells. Um, but I, I do want to have a little disclaimer here that even though I'm an author on this paper, um, I wanted to um, just uh, apologize because one of the things when I was doing my PhD uh, thesis here at Berkeley was that um, my um, colleague Jasper Ryan told me many times that you should not write cells which express, but cells that express. So I just want to um, take that as a disclaimer, and, and I will never make that mistake again. So this uh, was a paper that showed that uh, telomerase becomes activated in cancer cells. Uh, and then uh, two years later, um, uh, a definitive paper also showing that in um, most human cancer cells, uh, you have telomerase activity in order for those cells uh, to go on and continue uh, dividing. So this is uh, getting back to some of the uh, uh, issues that I raised yesterday uh, in the talk, um, in that telomerase is required for cells that divide many times. Uh, so the fact that you see um, uh, activation of telomerase in cancer cells, this uh, one particular cell undergoes a genetic change that has to divide many times, and this uh, cancer cell has to solve the telomere problem. Um, and one of the ways it does that um, is by uh, activating telomerase. After fundamental discoveries are made in a particular field, um, it turns out that there can be a lot of activity in the field. And so what I've shown you so far is uh, many of the papers uh, that throughout the 80s, which were leading up to establishing all of the different components, um, the telomere binding proteins, the telomere sequence, uh, the telomerase activity, to understand what might be going on with telomeres. And so if you look at uh, the total number of publications uh, with the word uh, telomerase uh, in it, um, across here, there were a number of publications, but it looks like it's zero. Um, and then, um, at this point, once we have enough uh, enabling discoveries, uh, the number of publications uh, really just uh, skyrocketed, uh, and people started uh, investigating um, more about different kinds of cancer cells and um, how much telomerase is there and what's going on with the telomere length. Um, so this is um, really a, a common phenomenon in many fields once you reach a critical mass of, of understanding of the individual components. So um, we had understood uh, the telomere uh, sequence led to understanding senescence, um, and it also uh, led to understanding uh, the role of telomeres in cancer. It was very important, though, to understand the different components if we were going to understand uh, the role of, of telomeres in human disease, to understand those components that are on uh, the ends of chromosomes. And the first identification of the uh, 
proteins that bind to the ends of chromosomes in human cells uh, came from uh, these two papers uh, from the uh, DeLonga lab, uh, identifying uh, this protein TRF1 for telomere repeat binding factor and TRF2. Um, and you can show in this nice um, set of uh, chromosomes over here, uh, now we're looking at the actual proteins that are bound uh, to the chromosome ends, uh, that these proteins are binding uh, to the very ends um, of these uh, human telomeres. And so uh, the identification of TRF1 uh, and TRF2 then led to um, the identification of what we now call this sheltering complex. So TRF1 binds along the length of the telomeric DNA as does TRF2. So these were the first two uh, components that were identified. And we now know of this complex uh, of proteins uh, that's needed to protect uh, the human chromosome ends uh, and also um, plays a role in um, elongation of the telomeres with telomerase. So we still, at that point, although we knew uh, many of the different components, we didn't know what the um, makeup of telomerase was. We knew it had an RNA component that provided the template, but the catalytic component of telomerase uh, remained um, elusive. Um, and it was, again, uh, the ciliated protozoa uh, that came uh, to the rescue. So um, uh, Joachim Ligner in Tom Check's lab first identified uh, the uh, catalytic component of telomerase uh, from uh, uh, another ciliate called Euplodes. And then working together uh, with Vicky Lundblatt showed that there was a very similar uh, kind of an enzyme uh, in yeast. Um, and this is just one uh, figure from their paper where they were able to show uh, that the important catalytic uh, regions of this uh, enzyme that they had identified actually was similar uh, to a reverse transcriptase. So this is an example of uh, the HIV-RT uh, suggesting uh, that this uh, telomerase reverse transcriptase um, was the catalytic component um, of telomerase. And this was, um, was quite uh, an important discovery because now that the field had uh, their hands on an actual molecule, you can then go uh, and do experiments uh, to test hypotheses. Um, and one of the first um, experiments that was done um, after the identification of the TERT enzyme and uh, knowing what the, the human TERT was, um, was to um, express that uh, component inside human cells and as I had shown you that uh, if you look at um, cells that have been grown for a long time in culture, you have relatively short telomeres, uh, as shown in these four lanes here. Uh, but as soon as you uh, put back uh, the telomerase, and so you add more telomerase to cells, uh, what you find is that the telomeres are elongated. Um, and in this case, uh, this would um, increase uh, the number of cell divisions that those cells would go through uh, in culture, showing that the telomeres actually do limit uh, the number of times cells can grow in culture. And this was quite a, an enabling um, discovery uh, because now um, in a number of different laboratories uh, working in a variety of different cell types, uh, people could grow cells uh, and be able to study them for um, a longer period of time in culture. And so uh, today, many different human primary cells uh, can be grown for a long term in culture if you simply put this telomerase back into the cells, you can now grow those cells because they're not long, no longer limited uh, by the short telomeres. So in terms of uh, practical applications for scientists, uh, this makes it easier uh, to understand uh, many different cell types. So the identification of the human telomeric sequence uh, directly uh, enabled the uh, understanding of shelterin, um, and uh, telomerase uh, uh, allowed the discovery of the TERT component, which then allowed uh, many uh, additional discoveries uh, to be made. So the, the final question that I'll, um, I'll just leave you with here, uh, I won't go through um, uh, many of the other discoveries, but the question about um, what actually happens uh, without telomerase. Uh, and this was the subject um, of my talk yesterday, uh, but this is just an example of if you have uh, mice uh, that lack telomerase in the first generation, you cross those mice, you get second generation mice uh, that have shorter telomeres. You breed those second generation mice, you get third generation mice with shorter telomeres, um, et cetera, uh, for increasing number of generations, that this progressive telomere shortening uh, in mice um, actually need, leads to um, a number of different uh, complications. Um, and what happens um, at the, the cellular level is that with each uh, generation, uh, the telomeres get shorter, uh, and those short telomeres then trigger uh, either cell death or cell senescence. Uh, and this was uh, shown by a, a number of different groups. However, um, it turns out that um, some cells can actually um, escape 
uh, this cellular senescence. Although most of the time what happens uh, is the cells undergo cellular senescence, the short telomeres also um, play another role. Um, and this was also something that was shown um, a number of years before. And that is that they can sometimes escape and they can undergo uh, a recombination pathway uh, that allows them to escape senescence. Um, and so uh, this is just uh, a figure from uh, this paper of uh, Vicki Lundblatt and uh, Liz Blackburn uh, indicating that um, there is a bypass pathway that if you don't have elongation by telomerase, the telomeres can be elongated by recombination. And this is harking back to what was uh, proposed um, about 10 years earlier. And that is the recombination at telomeres. So the discovery of telomerase led to being able to ask the question about what are the consequences of short telomeres. Um, and remarkably, uh, recombination is one of those uh, consequences. And this is something that, um, again, the process doesn't necessarily work uh, linear linearly. Um, recombination was uh, proposed uh, a number of years before. The, um, the cellular senescence is one of the consequences of telomeres. Uh, initiation of the DNA damage response um, and, and cell death uh, was another uh, uh, consequence. So the uh, overall uh, um, uh, synthesis of this is that um, defining the molecular components together with understanding the consequences of short telomeres allowed the discovery of a human disease mechanism. So um, many of these uh, components that we've been building up um, over the years uh, then led to uh, the understanding of uh, the human genetic disease, uh, dyskeratosis congenita. So understanding the telomerase RNA and understanding the consequences of short telomeres uh, led to um, uh, knowing that this uh, disease is actually uh, a disease of short telomeres which then um, several years later uh, made it clear that there are really a collection of different um, effects of short telomeres, uh, often called the uh, telomere syndrome. Understanding these consequences uh, puts new understanding about uh, telomere length regulation, uh, and these uh, experiments are really still um, uh, the focus of many different laboratories today. So um, as I was uh, concluding uh, yesterday, uh, discovery is not a linear process, uh, and new discoveries sometimes come from unlikely places, tetrahymena uh, and oxytrica. So some of the themes uh, that we've been uh, discussing uh, here today, curiosity is a driver of discovery. Discoveries happen in batches. People talk to each other and replication is essential to establish new discoveries. Fields collide and inform each other. Scientific discovery is not like engineering. You have to be ready to change direction and follow what's most interesting. And chance favors the prepared mind. And so with that, I'll just leave you with um, one final slide, um, and that is um, where was telomerase actually discovered? Wendell M. Stanley Hall at UC Berkeley. Many of you may or may not recognize this. This is a nice vintage car sitting outside um, on the circle. And uh, my final um, point today is that you can't go home again. This is what happened to Stanley Hall. So here's the, the remnants of, of how it used to look. And now there is a, a, a new um, beautiful building in its place. So I'll thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, great talks. Um, I read a biography last year about Henrietta Lacks, who was uh, the donor for um, HeLa cells. Yes. Sorry, I'm a chemist, not a biologist. But uh, it's my understanding that those cells were somehow unique in being able to avoid senescence and were used widely in molecular biology research and uh, uh, until recently. And, I, and I'm wondering if there's any understanding now of uh, were, were those cells somehow uh, able to use one of these mechanisms to re, um, uh, avoid senescence? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the HeLa cells are a, um, a cell type that is derived from uh, cancer. So in the case of the Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks, it was her tumors that were put into culture. Um, and this happened for many other uh, different uh, cell types. Um, and, and as I had shown, uh, what happens is that telomeres do get short, but then uh, telomerase becomes activated in cancer cells. So that's a widely common phenomenon. Um, in the case um, of the HeLa cells, um, it happened that they um, were found to be very useful by, 
by people, and so they've been used in a number um, of different laboratories, um, as are uh, other cell lines. So there isn't anything unique about uh, those cells having activated telomerase, um, but they were a, a cell type that was um, uh, very easy to grow in, in culture uh, because they had been derived from a tumor, and so they were um, a very uh, useful resource for understanding human cells, and so they were widely distributed uh, to, to many researchers to um, understand uh, human biology. Thank you so much for your lecture. My question is, um, you said the study was done on rats. So the synergist effect of um, the cells getting short, you talked about that, but how do you make them grow? I mean, as far as diet and activity, how did you make the cells grow in the rats? Um, do you mean the tumors or? Um... No, healthy, we want healthy cells, right, that, that are long? So uh, the experiment that I showed where you can take uh, normal human cells and normally the telomeres are shortening progressively, mm -hmm. and then if you put back this enzyme telomerase, you can uh, make the telomeres be elongated and those cells will now grow uh, for many, many more divisions because you no longer have uh, the short telomeres that limit the growth of those cells. So those are normal cells that now have what we would call um, uh, an extended lifespan or, or have become immortal. Immortal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have two interrelated questions. Number one, in the cancer cell, you mentioned telomere length is shortened. So why does cancer cell not enter into senescence? Why does it keep on dividing? And second thing you mentioned in the cancer cell, telomerase activity is very high. So why does telomerase does not make the telomere length go back to the normal length? So you, you hit on something uh, exactly that's kind of counterintuitive. I did tell you that um, cancer cells tend to have shorter telomeres, and I showed you some evidence um, from his, some historical papers. Cancer cells have shorter telomeres, but cancer cells also have telomerase activity. Um, and so it's that telomerase activity that maintains the telomere length in the cancer cells. So that's why they don't undergo senescence. So they started off with long telomeres, they went through a number of rounds of cell divisions where the telomeres were shortening, and then they got telomerase activity by, we're not sure exactly what mechanism, perhaps a mutation. Now they have telomerase activity, and now they're maintaining the telomere length. Why they don't go back up to the original level, we don't know the answer to that. That's a very good uh, question. Uh, however, we do know that these are cancer cells, and so they don't have um, many of the normal uh, regulatory mechanisms um, that, that normal cells would have. So. Um, we have actually done the experiment of shortening the telomeres in a completely normal organism, in mice, and then when you put telomerase back, you do end up going back to that normal set point because it's the, the, the normal regulation um, of those uh, enzymes. But, but it doesn't uh, often happen in the cancer cells, and that's because those are probably disrupted cells. But you're right, it's counter counterintuitive. Uh, sorry, I have one more question. What do you think if a cell has entered in the senescence, can that cell can be reverted back to the active state, or this cell will remain again forever for the senescence? Um, that is a good question. Once this, uh, an individual cell has entered senescence, it is thought that you cannot drive it out of senescence. And these are experiments that were done before telomerase. Uh, if you can put in um, uh, agents which will um, cause the cell to undergo DNA replication. Um, in the experiments that I'm um, showing you where you take a culture of cells, and all of those cells are heading towards senescence, now you put telomerase into the cells, some of the cells are still actively dividing. They haven't yet gotten to that final senescence point. And so when you put the telomerase in, now you rescue those cells that are dividing and the telomeres get long and those cells don't enter senescence. Um, but it, but I, I did not show you that if it's actually already that one cell is in senescence that you can get out of that. Probably not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, does the same biology apply in the plant kingdom? And I'm wondering about some trees that can last, uh, live for hundreds of years and whether it has a similar relation to telomerase or telomeres. Um, yes, one, one of the things that's really um, very nice to study something so fundamental as, as chromosome ends is that uh, the mechanisms are conserved across all organisms, that is all organisms that have linear chromosomes. Um, and so yes, this, this mechanism does occur in plants. There are a number of um, plant studies that have been done out there. The telomerase is known, the telomere length is known. Um, but just as um, in, uh, uh, in mammalian cells, uh, the telomeres don't determine 
uh, the maximum lifespan of organisms. That is, the maximum lifespan of human being about 100, 120 years old, that is not determined by telomeres. And we can show that in mice and a number of other um, organisms. There are probably many different things that determine the maximum lifespan. So similarly in plants, the telomeres aren't going to determine how long that organism is going to live, but the telomeres are carrying out the exact same function, the telomerase is the same, um, and these mechanisms are conserved. And another thing, in the um, complex with, which includes CERT, is there any supposition that that was introduced evolutionarily by a retrovirus? I'm not sure what complex you're talking about. Um, the CERT part of the... Oh, the TERT. Turk. Oh, yes, yes, the telomerase, uh, yes. Um, dyslexia. So, so telomerase, um, the telomerase enzyme uh, copies RNA that's part of the enzyme into DNA on the ends of the chromosomes. And so it has hallmarks of um, what is now found also in reverse transcriptases. But if you actually look back evolutionarily, uh, they're both related to uh, enzymes that, that copied RNA. Um, and so uh, they diverged uh, later on. So you may, there are some supposition that the actual, the telomerase diverged before the reverse transcript, transcriptases had, um, diverged, uh, but they are related with the common ancestor. Good, thank you for the talk. Uh, in your uh, multiple generations of your knockout mice, I didn't see comparative survival curves. And it, it appears that you can have multiple generations without your t uh, telomerase and still have viable progeny yes. that live. Yeah. You can in both, uh, in mice, for the first um, three generations when the telomeres are shortening. Uh, in the absence of telomerase, there is no consequence of the telomere shortening as long as your telomeres are long. Once the telomeres get to be shorter, in our case in the third, fourth, fifth generations as they're, as they're shortening, the short telomeres themselves then trigger apoptosis or senescence, which causes diseases. So you can live without telomeres as long as your telomeres are long, but then once the telomeres get short, and the same thing is found in human families that don't have enough telomeres. In the early generations, there's no consequence, and it's not until the later generations. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. Yesterday, you had mentioned that there is no clinical research or evidence that shows products that are out, currently out there being marketed to help lengthen telomeres. So can you address whether, I'm assuming that there is research currently going on to try to find um, you know, either plant or botanicals or something that will help to lengthen telomeres. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there may not be clinical research study data, but that there's many you know, hundreds, thousands of anecdotal data about um, things like traditional Chinese medicinal herbs that can help to, um, you know, help bone marrow or, or, or um, make gray hair black again, like Hoshu Wu. So can you address that? Um, I'm not an expert in any of those uh, sorts of um, uh, medicines. Uh, I certainly know um, that there is a lot of interest in um, in both sides of looking at, at telomerase, in um, finding ways to um, lengthen telomeres in the setting of uh, bone marrow failure and pulmonary fibrosis, that if we had some mechanism whereby you could lengthen uh, the telomeres and maintain them, that would be really an outstanding treatment from people that are, are dying from these uh, diseases. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in, in looking at that. And there has also been, on the other side, some interest in looking at telomerase inhibitors um, as approaches to cancer. Um, but now that we know a little bit more about the normal consequences of having less telomerase, we need to just step back and think a little bit about um, uh, how long you would want to inhibit telomerase before you may have um, other effects. So one needs to have a, a little bit more of a nuanced um, approach. But these are definitely uh, areas that, that people are actively uh, trying to understand um, as, uh, as we understand the disease, um, understanding treatments for the, the disease. My colleagues um, at Hopkins you know, see patients every day uh, that are dying from these diseases and there's no treatment. So we are very interested in, in, in pursuing that. Thank you.